things. Summertime is a time to celebrate. Like we'll be doing this weekend with picnics and parades and fireworks. And according to scripture, celebration is at the heart of the life that God created us to live. In the Old Testament, God commands his people to observe three pilgrimage festivals or feasts throughout the year. These three are the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover, the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. Now, in all three of these festivals, God's people are to leave their work, leave their hometown, leave their routines and to-do lists, and travel to Jerusalem, where they will celebrate the festival for seven days. Each festival lasts seven days. When's the last time you went to a seven-day party? Some of you know Esther. That's my niece who grew up in India. She's engaged to get married. But in parts of India, they still have weddings that last seven days. Like, that's how long the celebration lasts. I mean, we're, we, we, we're, we struggle to fit in an afternoon, right? <laughs> like one Saturday afternoon. But God commands these festivals to last for seven days. And these are only the three major festivals. There are other festivals or holy days commanded in the Old Testament, such as Purim, such as the Feast of Trumpets, which is Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and the Day of Assembly. God gives his people a lot of holy days from which we get the word holidays. God doesn't want us to work all the time. God doesn't want us to be serious all the time. God wants us to play and laugh and enjoy good food. So God commands us, commands us to celebrate. Why? Well, I, I think there's probably many reasons for this. But one reason is because our soul needs gratitude. And from a biblical standpoint, celebrating involves gratitude. Celebrating involves giving thanks to God. When we celebrate... We pause to remember who God is and what God has done. And we see that described so beautifully in Psalm 103. Psalm 103 declares, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's celebrating, blessing God for all his benefits, blessing God for all of who he is and all that God has done, who forgives our sins and heals our diseases, and redeems our life from the pit, and crowns us with steadfast love and mercy, and satisfies our desires with good things, and works justice for the oppressed, who removes our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west, who has compassion on us as a, a father has compassion on his children, whose love is from everlasting to everlasting, a God who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. This is celebrating, remembering who God is and what God has done. And notice in this psalm, the language is kind of odd in a way if you think about it. The author is instructing his soul to celebrate, to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The author is, is telling her soul what to do. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Now, why would you tell your soul to do that? Because our soul needs gratitude. The psalmist is leading his soul in the practice of being grateful. The practice of remembering all that God has done. Our souls were made to bless the Lord. In fact, as John Orberg points out, in Jesus' day, every devout Israelite would pray what was called the 18 benedictions. In Hebrew, a benediction was any prayer that began with the word bless. In the morning when they woke up, they would pray 18 times, blessed are you, God. And when, in the nighttime, when they went to bed, they would pray 18 times, blessed are you, God. And in the middle of the day, they would pause and pray the 18. Blessed are you, God, who abundantly forgives. And on the Sabbath, they would pray the 18 benedictions an extra time. This was their way of training for gratitude, of reminding themselves that all that is good comes from God. All of life is a gift. God is the giver of the gifts. 
We are the recipients. And none of us deserves all of the great gifts that God has given us or all that God has done for us. That's the mindset of gratitude. But we need to train for this mindset because the default mode of the sinful human race is complaint and entitlement. It's so easy for us to complain, right? Anyone? It's easy to complain, right? I'm the only one raising my hand. Okay, I see heads nodded though. It's, it's just, it comes so easily to complain about how hot it is, to complain about how expensive it is here, to complain about how crowded it is, uh, to complain about what's going on at work, or uh, to complain about what's going on in Kailua or Hawaii or in our country, to complain about our politicians or, or the direction that our country is going. And I'm right there. It is my default mode. And I think there's so much complaining about our country right now really from the left or from the right, like everyone just has an abundance to complain about. And, and I was reminded of that uh, just a couple of days ago because Matt Brennan, who's a member of our church, he's an officer in the Marines, he's on deployment in South Africa, overseeing all the Marines that are guarding the U.S. embassies in 24 or 20 some, 20 something African nations. And we collected care cards for Matt the last two weeks to send to him. And he sent me a text just two days ago, and in his text he wrote, I've been to 21 countries in Africa and have two more to go to. Makes you realize how blessed we are just because we live in the U.S. Do we realize how blessed we are? I think sometimes we have to pause to think about that. The Hebrew word for gratitude is hikarat hatav, which literally means recognizing the good. Gratitude means recognizing the the good. We need to train ourselves to recognize the good, or we can fall into a spirit of complaint or a, a spirit of grumbling, as the uh, scriptures call it. We can also fall into a spirit of entitlement. Uh, a pastor I know of once saw a beautiful million dollar y yacht sitting in the harbor of Newport Beach, California, and written across this yacht, big bold letters, was the word deserved. Whatever I have, I deserve. And this isn't just an issue for super rich yacht owners. All human beings struggle at times with a sense of entitlement. We have expectations of what life should be like, and when those aren't met, we get angry. If I'm not getting something I want, somebody somewhere is messing up and, and they owe me. Or, I simply look at what I have and I believe that I gained it all on my own. I earned it and I deserve it. But here's what we see in our world of increasing stuff and decreasing happiness. The more I think I'm entitled to, the less I will be grateful for. Biblical celebration cuts against entitlement. It trains our hearts and minds to remember that God is the source of all good gifts, gifts that none of us deserve. So this week, as you celebrate the 4th of July, I want to invite you to do a gratitude experiment. And this is something that I saw from John Ortberg, and I think it's a great idea. It's simply an experiment in reflecting on what you're grateful for, but to pray your own benedictions to do your own statements in which you bless God for all his benefits. Now, you don't have to start with 18, but you can. The 18 benedictions, maybe you want to start with four or five or 10. But simply to first write down what you are grateful for, and then write these things out, beginning with the words, blessed are you, O Lord. And when we bless God, we're actually... We're praising God, so we're directing our gratitude to God when we do so. For example, blessed are you, O Lord, for giving me my children. Blessed are you, O Lord, for helping me get through this difficult day. Blessed are you, O Lord, for forgiving me when I sin. Blessed are you, Lord, for the, the beautiful sunrise over Kailua Beach. Try this this week to do four or 10 or 18 benedictions. Try this this week and see how it affects you. Our souls need 
gratitude. Which is why it's such a good thing to follow God's command to celebrate. 